So just before we really get started, I want to do a small intro and ask you, what if, what if I could download executable files from almost anywhere, including highly trusted websites like Google and Bing? What if once click, those files execute immediately without any warnings to the user and enable attackers to gain full control over the user's machine? Well, RFD, Reflected File Download, is a new web attack vector that enables attackers just that to gain full control over the user's machine by virtually downloading files um, from highly trusted domains. And really, it could be as simple as this. You simply see a valid link, for example, to google.com. Um, you click on it, you get the download, and if you open it, in this case, it's shutting down your PC, but in other cases, it could do a lot worse. So if you wanna be an RFD expert, I'm gonna release a white paper with all the tiny bits of the details for your convenience. So if you follow my Twitter on follow my team's work and blog, you'll find the white paper there soon enough. I hope that in the upcoming weeks, um, this week or the week after, it's gonna be available for you. Well, it's the last talk for today, so let's get when a party started. In the summer, to my heartbeat sound. Well, two and a half months ago, exactly two and a half months ago, I was on my way to heavenly Las Vegas. Wow, Las Vegas is so amazing. And especially around summertime, it has some of the best pool parties in the world. You should check it out. Um, and it also has so many fantastic, amazing, beautiful, beautiful security professionals that are gathering together in two major security conferences. The first one is Black Hat, followed by DEF CON. Now, why am I even telling you this? Because here I was, standing in the middle of the room full of security professionals, talking about security, yeah! And I was telling those guys about reflected file download, the new, attack, uh, the new web attack vector that I created, and how powerful I think it was and what do you know? They liked it. They told me, you are right about it. This is an issue. We should definitely fix that. And I was excited. I was living the dream because there is nothing more joyful for a security professional than being told that you are right by other security professionals. Am I not right? So excitement kept on growing as on the very last day of my trip to Vegas, I get this email telling me that my talk about reflected file download got accepted to Black Hat Europe and I get a chance to convince other security professionals that RFD is of some concern. So by now, you probably know that talk is about reflected file download, you probably know that this is a new web attack vector, but what I haven't told you yet is that my name is Oren Hafif, and I'm a security uh, researcher for Trustwave Spider Labs, and I wanna thank you all for staying to this talk. I know it's the last talk for today. I hope that you're gonna find it interesting, and really, it's been a great conference, so kudos to the organizers. It was really high class, and I'm gonna try to maintain this level. Now, before we start, um, I've gotta confess something. I'm a control freak and I'd like to know exactly what's going to happen. So the first slide for today is the agenda. So you, you'll know what's coming up and we're gonna set some objectives because I'm here for a reason and there is something for you to take, whether you're a builder, a breaker, or a defender of web applications, there is something I want you to take out of this session. And surprise, surprise, the majority of the talk, we're gonna invest in understanding reflected file download and we'll do this by answering those three simple questions. What is reflected file download? What is it all about? Why? Why should I care about it? What's the motivation behind the attack? And of course, the technical how-tos 
and technical details. And eventually, I've got some advanced exploitation uh, for those of you who want to get a, a, a little bit more technical about it. So I've got a plan. We're going to understand what is reflected file download by sh showing you a demo and analyzing the demo. By, by then, I hope you'll get a general idea of what is reflected file download. Then we're going to talk about a motivation behind the attack. Why would attackers choose this? What are the implications? And we're going to also talk about the trust model for web downloads. Do you know the, the trust model? I, I should have said the lack of trust model for web downloads and how it really fuels up the motivation uh, behind this attack. And of course, it's a technical conference, so I'm not going to spare the details of how to detect, how to exploit, and how to prevent RFD. And we're going to do this by taking a real example, a real attack that I did on Google, and reconstructing it together from scratch. So you'll have no excuse when you decide you want to find your RFD vulnerabilities. Well, let me tell you just a tiny bit about myself. Um, this Saturday, I turned 28. Um, this is like a big <laughs> issue for me. Um, anyways, th this reminds me that I've been doing martial arts for the last nine years, uh, Aikido and Karate, and it's been a rough start. As you can see, I'm the one hitting the floor on all three pictures, but persistence pays off, and today I'm beating this other guy. Um, and I'm using a lot of the concept out of martial arts when I see web applications. So I've been breaking web applications for the last seven years. This is what I do. Um, I've got acknowledged by major companies for finding bugs in the software, Hall of Fames, bug bounties, um, and also I've got a few CVs on my name. So I believe I do know my way around web security. But we're not here to talk about myself. We're here for a reason. And this reason is that I want you to take something out of this. So if you're a breaker of web applications, if you are a pen tester, if you're engaged in security audits for your clients, I want you to be able to detect and report RFD issues. Now, on the other hand, if you are a defender, if you are involved in configuration of web servers, if you have a security product, if you control the web application firewall, you'll be able to block and prevent RFD issues with ease. And if you're a builder of web apps, if you're a developer, you're going to be a better developer, and you're going to write more secure APIs and web apps. Now, this is a very good friend of mine. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to this little fellow. This is Windows Calculator. Now, I know the majority of the audi audience might know this already, but when this little fellow pops up, it means game over. It means we've got control over the machine. The attacker chooses to do this, as it's very obvious, and it's a great proof of concept. But we could have formatted a PC. We could install crypto lockers. We can shut down the, the PC, whatever. So let's watch the demo. Now let me walk you through. What you're seeing here is the Google Plus page for Google Glass. You know, this gl special glasses they're developing. And there's been a long-awaited Google Glass emulator. So what I did, I posted on this forum, uh, here you go, this is the google.com link, HTTPS link, to the Glass installer that you will get you your emulator or whatever. And once you click on it, you can see that a file get download from google.com. Now this builds up trust, and if you click on this file with no warnings, that's it. That's game over for the user. Now, RFD is a web application issue, and to prove it, we're going to take this link and we're going to paste it in different browsers. So let's take this link, for example, this was Firefox. Let's take it to Chrome, and Chrome is even greater because it doesn't even ask you if you want to download a file. It just downloads it. And again, single click, no warnings from the operating system, 
and your exploit executes. Now IE, IE takes a bit longer, so let me just help IE for a bit. Yeah. Well, yeah, just a second. Well, it's gonna happen eventually. Well, if the user is still here, then when, you click the, when he clicks the run uh, button, that's it, and it's working on IE as well. So now that we saw the demo, let's talk about it, what, what actually happened here. Well, the user clicked on a valid link to google.com. Once, uh, once this happened, a malicious, malicious file got downloaded from google.com, and once click, our exploit executed without any pop-ups or warning and long-live Windows calculator. Now, that's a pretty simple attack flow. And in order to get this level of privileges, we normally have to use fancy browser bugs and vulnerabilities that involves very technical people messing up with the memory. This is not the case with RFD. Anyone, any script kitty can create this type of exploit. So by now, I, I want to announce something I haven't yet show you, but no upload takes place. I don't have upload privileges to any Google web server. But a file get downloaded, so this gives us upload less downloads. And I really like this term because it really reflects what the attack is. So by now, I hope you get a general ID, just a general ID of what is reflected file download. But why would this be an attack vector of choice for attackers? Well, you can gain full control over the user's machine. What else do you want? That's as far as I can go. Now, I can break it for you to like a gazillion different bullets, but this is pretty much it. And it circumvents confidentiality. You can steal everything off this machine. It circumvents the availability. Format a minus F is a great command. And uh, it also damages integrity. And I'm gonna show you something interesting. In the majority of web attacks, we are locked within the browser. RFD takes us a step out of the browser into the operating system. But we're gonna get back into the browser, but with superpowers, and we get complete control over Chrome, get cookies for any website from any domain, perform actions, and steal data of it. So this will be in the advanced exploitation part. Now, why wouldn't I just t take my malware and put it somewhere, like on a hosting service? Why do I need RFD? Well, to answer this question, we need to understand how do we trust downloads? What makes us trust downloads? And to answer this question, we need to understand how do we trust websites? And we do have a trust model for websites. Now, there's no better example than online bank banking. We all use online banking, and obviously we trust it. So let's just take off the list the number one bank in the US, and this bank has nothing to do with RFD, so please don't sue me. Um, it's just a good example for how good website looks. Um, well, a lot of users, now think about it, look at this website, what makes you trust it? Well, of course, for a lot of users, it's the number of locks in the page. <laughs> well, there are four locks here, so it makes us feel so secure, and this is something I notice a lot. You're getting like attacked with locks from everywhere. So you've got to feel secure. But we do actually have a trust model for, web, uh, for websites, right? Especially HTTPS websites, if the HTTPS is really HTTPS. Um, and you can see that the entire address bar is like glowing green. Now that's a pretty obvious security indicator. The domain name as well is what we're expecting it to be. And the uh, certificate was signed and issued for the rightful owner of this domain. So if you think about it, we are not trusting websites. We are trusting domain names. Now, 
it's all about the trust. This doesn't answer yet, how do we trust download? And really, really, it's all about trusting the download. And if you fail to do this, if you trust the wrong download, you can get the operating system damaged severely, as demonstrated in the following video. <laughs> yeah, so we definitely want to get this one right. We don't, that, that's pretty painful. Um, I know we can watch it all day, but <laughs> let's, make, uh, let's make the dilemma more clear, the conflict, by looking at a more technical approach. On the first scenario, the user is browsing around example.com, and there is a download link there. And this download link links to a google.com file. In this case, it's a Chrome, it's a Chrome setup, sorry. Well, the setup downloads from a Google web server. But on the second example, we are browsing around google.com. We all do this at least once a day, I believe, if you're not paranoid. And the link to the file is placed on a google.com web page, but the file actually sits somewhere else. It could be SourceForge, it could be GitHub, any hosting service. So the file is downloaded from somewhere else as would be, for, for example, if we would not use RFD. Again, first example, first scenario, file is downloaded from a google.com web server which builds up trust. But on the second example, file, the link to the file is on a google.com web page which builds up trust as well. So which one would you trust? And to some of you, it might be very clear. You might think to yourself, well, of course, it's option A, or yeah, duh, it's option B, or I'm not trusting anyone, I'm a paranoid, I'm, don't, I'm not downloading files anymore. <laughs> but really, in order to get the answer to this question, then why not just ask? So I ask a lot of people, a lot of security professionals and users, and this is what I got. 81% of the users said, they will trust a download based on the hosting domain. Less than 20% noted that what impacts them more is the link's location. That's pretty, that's pretty much it. I mean, four out of five people would trust a download based on the domain it is downloaded from. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, exactly what RFD exploits. It exploits this trust and makes your social engineering attacks and malware distribution effort much more successful and, um, and worthwhile. Well, yeah, it is a technical conference. By now, you should have a general idea of what is RFD, you should get that, you know that attackers want to gain complete control over our PC, right? And you know that their probability to doing so is greater with RFD. Now all we've got to do is to teach you the technical details. And we're gonna do this by recreating an entire uh, vulnerability that I found in the Google Autocomplete feature. So most of you know this feature, it's great. You type in a word, and it gives you a suggestion. Now, we're not going to talk about Google fails. There is a whole website for that. Um, and it's sometimes not so successful. For example, here, you type in why can't, and it auto-completes why can't I own a Canadian, which is something to think about seriously. Um, just a, another one, when you type in Americans think, well, Americans think that Obama is a cactus. Now, that's valuable information for the elections campaign. Um, but we're not here to talk about this. We're here to talk about a vulnerability in Google's autocomplete. Well, this is not magic. Whenever you type a letter, whenever you hit the, you hit the keyboard, a request is sent to the suggestion API on the Google.com it processes it, it sends it over to whoever it needs to send it over, and then you're getting the suggestions back in the response. Now, no black hat talk. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, is complete unless there is at least one slide with a user, a server, and a bunch of lines going back and forth. So, not going to disappoint you, here it is. So we just typed RFD, and a request is sent to google.com to the suggestion API that's marked with the letter S, and it contains our query string that was RFD. The server processes it, it works hard, and we're getting the suggestions. In this case, it's a JSON response. Now, some of you may know that, that our input is reflected to the response, as in reflected file download. Okay, I hope now it's, it's clear. Well, the pen testers here in the audience, I wanna tell you something, I can read your minds. You just thinking, send a double quotes character. Why is that so? Because our input got reflected is enclosed with double quotes. And we love breaking format, this is what we do. If we wanna do a JSON hijacking attack, if we wanna do a cross-site scripting in some cases, we wanna break the format. So your wish is my command, let's send this character over. And it got reflected, but there's an additional character here. And that's the backslash character, and it's just a, a party pooper, because it just tells the browser to ignore the special meanings of this double quote, so we actually haven't break format. But think about it, it's only in our minds, it's only in the browser context. What if we can go to a heavenly place where backslashes means nothing at all? Then we'll be able to kind of evade this technique of protection and get our input injected, and it's really all about the context. Take, for example, this little, little cute girl, and she's just throwing bubbles into the air. And look what happened when evil people around the web are changing the context. It just completely changes the meaning of the input. I'm sorry, uh, the, the meaning of the picture is completely changed. Now, this makes you feel not, not so comfortable, and probably, I apologize if it's too graphic, the, 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 probably the worst one, yeah? So, <laughs> it is all about the context. So let's play the what if game. What if I could take this, in the entire response um, that is generated from this input, RFD, double quotes, double pipe. Double pipe is the or command separator in Windows batch. So double pipe, calc, opens up Windows Calculator, and the OR operator again. And I can make this entire response open up in Windows Shell. Now I'm not going to do any additional work on that in getting this into Windows Shell, unless you're convinced that it's actually going to work. So let's take it out and put it in a Windows Shell interpreter. And first thing first, the, the Shell interpreter, the command line prompt, the, it doesn't know what you send over, right? So let's lose the red marking. It's starting from the beginning. It's starting to parse the, the commands until it reaches the double pipe command separator. And it tries to execute. And you don't have to be a batch expert to note that this is not a valid batch command. Now if you have to guess what's the Boolean value of this error, would it be a true value? Or do you think it's gonna be a false value? Well, you've guessed correctly, it's a false value. And since we have the OR operator coming, then we keep on going until something is true, right? So the next command we're gonna parse is the calc command and it's a valid command, guess what it's doing? It's Windows Calculator again. But what, what's happening with the rest of the command? Just to show you it's valid. Uh, calc open up successfully, so it's true. We have an OR operator, we completely ignore the rest of the command. 
So I hope I convinced you that my efforts are not for nothing, and now we can invest the efforts in getting this into Windows um, shell context. Great, so here is the, the response, and now we wanna make it download, reflected file download, we wanna make it download, and it's really, really easy, because we don't have to do anything. Since the content type is application JSON, some browsers will simply download it for us. They don't know how to display it, but Google did something even better. They added the cross-site scripting mitigation here. This is the content disposition header, um, which tells the browser, don't render this, uh, this uh, uh, response, just download it, because they wanna prevent cross-site scripting from happening. But this is set incorrectly, and what it actually does, it makes RFD work cross-browser easily without any additional efforts. Okay, so our shell commands are already there, our file get downloaded, but the, the browser needs to know which name to give to the download, right? And you don't have like nameless files. So it looks up in the URL, and this is where our second injection points come in. And what I did here, I'm using something that we like to forget, and it's called path parameters. So you can see this semicolon up there and this is something that is well-defined in the URI specifications. It's also supported officially by the Java servlet specifications. And it's actually legacy support for old browsers that do not support cookies. Now, the thing is that the web server will completely ignore this. But the browser, like all of the popular browsers, they will parse the file name out of this section. So now we're done. Our file is gonna be named setup.batch, which is opened in Windows shell context. It has our command inside. When the user opened this file, it's just game over. So we need to take this link, send it to the user. Once he clicks on the link, he is getting the setup.batch file, and clicking on this file results in this. So it's a bit of an overdose for Windows Calculator. You're probably not going to use it ever again. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. Now, I did what I promised to do, right? We, we, we recreated it, and everything is good except from, for the fact that some of you think to yourself, well, he's a liar. Well, that's not very nice of you to think. Um, because how come there were no warnings at all. Like this one saying, uh, this file is very, very bad, it's from an unknown publisher, don't open it, yeah, run away. Um, well, like, like we would treat this message, right? We'll click it away. But anyways, just to show you I'm not a liar, let's bypass some Windows security feature. So I'm giving you a Windows 7 security feature bypass, and it's gonna conveniently work for batch files it's gonna work for the .bat and CMD extensions, and it's gonna cause uh, uh, all warnings to, disable, to be disabled and get our exploit executed immediately. So this is where you have to really concentrate because this, I'm getting really technical here. So if the file name contains setup, install, or update, then there will be no warnings at all. So because it's that complicated, let's take an example. If you have a file that's named very, very bad update, since the word update is there, it's gonna execute without any warnings. So I'm not a liar, I did what I promised to do. <laughs> and let me show you some advanced stuff, some more advanced stuff, get a bit more technical, so you can all RFD like a boss. And tell you, if you're looking around to find RFD issues, you, you, won't be, you won't be in trouble, they're everywhere, trust me, then there's three simple requirements that are easy to memorize. The first one is reflected. You need some input to get reflected. And this is where we put our shell commands. 
The second requirement is file. We need to control the file name. This could be done using path parameters or using other ways for permissive URL mapping. Um, and really, it's all covered in the white paper. And download. We need the response to download. Now, being more specific, where can we find RFD? Well, any response with reflected input and a less common content type, by less common I mean not HTML and not XML, um, is very likely to be vulnerable. And, surprise, JSON APIs and JSON P APIs are extremely vulnerable. RFD is not a JSON attack. It's a general attack with general requirements. But I'm not going to cry because JSON APIs conveniently meet all those uh, requirements that we set. And JSON APIs are everywhere. So RFD is everywhere. Um, and we need the URL mapping to be permissive. By that I mean it's tolerant for additional slashes or the semicolon, and you'd be surprised how common this is. Uh, just to give you a preview, for JSON um, RESTful APIs, the slash character is actually um, a resource separator in the URL. So it's going to be tolerant, no problem, have fun. Now, we found our RFD exploit. Which, uh, sorry, RFD vulnerability, which exploit should we use? Well, I deeply recommend that you'll use the BAT and CMD extensions. Those are the easiest ones. You saw no warnings, easy. If you insist, you can use the JS, JSC, VBS, WSH, VBE, WSF, HTA extensions as well, as all of those are going to get you into Windows script host context which is equivalent to running shell commands. And you can also exploit other vulnerabilities in other installed software. So if you put your payload, get the file download as a PDF, if the PDF reader is vulnerable to an attack, you can uh, make user download PDFs, open it up. But seriously, the first one is like the easiest one, so why work hard? So let me give you some batch tricks. Now, you see there is the ampersand character, the pipe character, less than, greater than, new lines. And the thing is, they're all like good coffee. I like them whether they're single or double. They're going to do the trick. They're going to just work. Now, the last requirement was download. So can we force files to download or responses to download? Well, the answer is yes, but it's complicated. And if you have a content disposition header, sure, no problem. It's going to work cross bar browser if it's set in correctly, and we're going to get to this. It's going to work. If you're doing everything fine, then it's still going to be exploitable using Chrome and Opera because there is a HTML5 feature that lets the attacker to decide whether they want the response to download or not. So if they're creating uh, an anchor tag like you see on the slides and adding the word download, it's going to get downloaded from your site. If you're trying not to cache anything, well, that's just off topic, you need to consider this vector. And different browser behaves differently for different content types. Now to make sense out of this question, please stay tuned for the white paper that we'll be releasing very, very soon. And don't try to understand this table of the slides. Uh, you can see that I'm like psycho. And I, I created those fancy tables for you that you'll know how, exactly how which browser behave. And you can see there are many cases that this is cross-browser. Now let's get to the fun part and do some advanced exploitation. We've seen enough calculators already. Um, of course, you can do what you wish. You can do everything you're running OS command. But I really recommend using PowerShell. And the explanation is it's a PowerShell. It has more powers. And you can even ask for admin rights. And I love it. If you 
ask for admin rights with PowerShell, it's going to say Microsoft Windows, a certified, verified, whatever, is asking for admin privileges. So this is great. And you can also use PowerShell to create some, some kind of a dropper. You just put a general payload there, and it's downloading the rest of the malware, whatever you want. You want an exe file, you want whatever. You can just download it, execute it on the spot. And as I promised, we're going to get back into the browser context. We stepped out. Now we're getting back. And the only difference is we are going to have superpowers. We're going to get full control over Google Chrome. So I have a question. How many command line options do you think Google Chrome has? And come on, throw out numbers. I want to hear what you think. 50. 50. We've got a 50. 50. First time, 50. Yeah. 64, 64. The answer is over 900. <laughs> and to be exact, 973 and counting. And seriously, we're going to use just two. Now, this does not mean that the rest, 971, are not as bad. But all I need is two out of this. And I apologize, because whenever I rehearse this slide, I couldn't stop myself from laughing when I announced the name of the first command line option, which is Disable Web Security. <laughs> Yay! So guess what it does? It disables web security. It shuts down same origin policy. So that's great. Now, what it means that any window from any domain can access the cookie, can access everything in any other window of any other domain. Now, what would be really great if we had some command line to allow us to open as much windows as we want. Oh, disable pop-up blocker. So yeah, we've got those two together. So we can open up windows and access everything, no matter what's the domain name in there. Those two result in browser anarchy. And it's just one big mess. And you control Chrome completely. Now, I know the smalls here are a bit, um, the font here is a bit small, but I'm going to walk you through. So the user is getting a link to google.com. It's clicking on it, getting a file back from the Google servers called Chrome Setup. Once executed, it opens up Chrome with no security on the attacker's website. The attacker's website returns scripts that open windows and access what's in those windows, including that cookie. Well, let's build an exploit. Let's build an actual exploit. And it's going to be a bit more technical. Well, the first part is what we've seen before. It's invalid. It's going to result in an error. We have the double pipe operator, so we keep on going. The next command is the task kill command. Uh, which shuts down Chrome because we want to open it up in an insecure mode. And it's also good for our social engineering. We said we are installing Chrome, so let's shut down Chrome. But this is actually successful. I know it's confusing because we are closing Chrome. The close was successful. This returns true. So I'm going to teach you a trick. I'm using the single pipe to redirect the output out of the task kill command into the make directory command, md. Now, this is not valid, and it will result in an error. We have the double pipe operator. We keep on going. Then we're going to start Chrome. It's going to start up in the attacker's website with disable web security and disable pop-up blocker. This is going to be successful. The rest of the command is ignored. Now, let's, let's see a demo of me stealing some Gmail inbox and cookie. Now, I want you to remember that you, it's not limited to Gmail. You can do this to any website. And you can do this like for 30 websites at once. OK? So let's watch it. Now, let's go into my Gmail inbox. And I just got an email. This happens occasionally from myself. And this email says, 
that the Google's, uh, there is a Google Chrome security update, and there is a link to google.com. Now, I'm not easy to fool. I'm clicking on this link, but I'm going to the downloads folder to verify it was downloaded from an HTTPS google.com address. It was, I click on it, and it tells me I'm awesome, thank you, and it's installing Google Chrome. That's it. Now let's take a look on the attacker's website. Here's my Gmail cookie, and if you wanna read my emails, if you run, wanna read my entire inbox, then here you go. So now we know we can execute any command on the operating system. We can steal any information out of the browser. Now we want to spread this evilness to everyone. So what a better way than building a worm. So I hereby present what I believe to be the first cross-social network worm. It's the, the RFD worm. And it's going to spread itself over all of the social networks that you are connected to. Facebook. Twitter, Google+, and um, LinkedIn. Let's see the demo. So it's going to be a bit, it's going to start a bit similar to the first one. Um, so if you haven't gotten it on the first attempt, here's your chance. My friend that was attacked by the worm previously just shared a link saying again, uh, it's, there's a Chrome security update, and I click on this link, I validate it from google.com. I validate, yeah, thank you. So here it is, google.com, let's click on it, fireworks happening again, task kill, blah, blah, blah. And again, we are awesome, we just installed Chrome, but the only difference is that I'm gonna be a very, very lonely person. Because all of my Facebook friends just got attacked by the worm as well, as it made me share the link to the vulnerable page. All of my Twitter followers, and this is a test account, so please follow me. Um, they're also attacked by this um, um, worm. And all of my three Google Plus friends also got attacked by this worm. And my boss is going to fire me because if he follows my LinkedIn activity, he is also going to get attacked by the worm. Well, I hope I convinced you that this is an issue and we need to fix it. But let me tell you how I think we should fix it. Now, use exact URL mappings. Don't allow anything after your API name. One of the most important solutions here is never escape input. Escaping input is always bad for you because it contains the original problematic character. In this case, it's a double quote. But use encoding instead. As you can see, the encoding is numeric, is alphanumeric with a backslash, and the double quote can be presented as one of these. And it really depends on the output format, but you'll find a proper encoding, I'm sure. Add content disposition headers. Yeah, I know, add content disposition headers, but do it correctly with the file name attribute. This way, the browser don't have to start figuring out what's the file name and look in the URL. It's always going to be 1.txt, mitigating the vulnerability. Require custom headers for all of your APIs. APIs are normally accessed by other software, not by users. So if you require custom headers, you're getting uh, the power of, um, of the same origin policy. If possible, use CSRF tokens as well. Whitelist callbacks. Now, I stopped counting. I ran out of fingers of how many attacks had been on JSONP callbacks. There's been a, new, a great new attack right now um, by Ben Hayek that shows it. There's been Rosetta Flash. There's been a lot of other stuff going on with whitelist um, because not, no one whitelists callbacks. So whitelist your callbacks, come on. The callbacks are reflected by default, and it makes you almost certainly vulnerable 
to reflected file download. And force XSSI mitigations like this endless for loop never include API uh, error messages or user input in API error messages and remove support for path parameters. I just found a cross-site scripting on over 200 Google domains just because path parameters was, were allowed. So get rid of this. We don't need it anymore. Um, and use the X content type options, no sniff header, if you're using text plain formats. I'm going to show a new technique on how to make the browser download your files, in that case, in the white paper as well. Now let's sum it up. Your site can be used to attack users. Attackers can get full control over the victim's machine. A file is downloaded, but it's never uploaded. And I, an advanced exploit I show you advanced exploitation, including PowerShell, Chrome, and Windows Security Feature Bypasses. And eventually, I'm so scared, please fix it. You know how to. Now, in that manner, just a last statement, the last statement for this talk, the last slide. Who is responsible? Well, I want to read you a quote of the, out of the Google Vulnerability Reward Program rules. And it said, we recognize that the address bar is the only reliable security indicator in modern browsers. Ladies and gentlemen, if you own a domain name, if you own what's up there in the address bar, you are responsible for the content that you are returning and you are responsible for protecting users like me from RFD. Thank you very much for coming to this talk. Please follow my Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Watch out, watch out for, the, for the white paper that's coming. You, you've got all details there and I'll be taking questions now. So if you have any questions, that would be a good time. Yeah. So you mentioned a company that's familiar with Foundry. Do you know if all major browsers uh, prefer that over anything in your own? Yeah, uh, uh, it depends whether the link is same origin or not. Uh, same origin links, the download attribute is getting somewhere preferred, but you have to be same origin. For cross origin links, then there's been a fix. You're right about it. It wasn't this way. But right now, they prefer the content disposition header. Any other questions? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've worked on the question was well, does it all only works on Windows 7? The answer it works on every Windows PC. But the thing with the warning, the users are, are, will get the warning if it's not Windows 7, but both you and I know they're going to click the warning away. If they've decided to download the file, it's not, they're going to open the file. It's not going to sit there. They don't download files for nothing. Any other questions? I'll, yeah. Man, I love you. That's like the, that's the most awesome uh, questions ever. Um, he asked if we can use the Unicode character of uh, 22E uh, to uh, switch the left, um, left and right uh, orientation and spoof the, um, spoof the extension of the file. Unfortunately, we can't do this because it's, it's not sent and being decoded. It stays in the browser level when it's parsing the file name. So fortunately not, but that's a great question. Any other questions? I guess this vulnerability has been fixed by Google. Yeah, the question was, was it fixed by Google? The answer is, it's complicated. They have fixed it. I hacked it again. They fixed it. Right now, we're talking about some other stuff related. Um, but eventually, they did a fix in a core um, feature, like that was organization-wide. Uh, so it took them a lot of time. It took them several months to do. But it's mostly fixed on Google. It's fixed on Bing. But if I had to just start naming the number of websites that are Alexa Top 100 that are vulnerable to RFD, 
you guys are going to stay in Amsterdam forever. So it's like, it's an endless list. And I just can't responsibly disclose all of this before the Black Hat talk. It would be impossible and time consuming. Any other questions? I want to let you guys go. So uh, go party. It's, it's the end of the conference. Have fun. I'm here. So if you have questions, you're shy, come over. I'll, I'll take those questions. Thank you.